I want you to take your Bible, if you would, please, and open it up to the book of Philippians, chapter 3. Philippians, chapter 3. Philippians is the happy book. You, you don't find anything negative. I, I, I'll point out a couple of verses. It's as close as you get to something negative in the book of Philippians. It's a happy book. And, uh, and from that, I want to talk to you about the future grows brighter. Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved." Those are the most important words you will hear this morning. I could just give the benediction and we go home now because you've heard the most important things that are going to come from up here. And that is God speaking to us through his word. Let's pray. Father, I ask that as we look into your word this morning, uh, you'll challenge our hearts. You'll, you'll give strength and comfort and direction and encouragement where needed. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. Guide us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to leave happy today. I want you, when you go out of here, I want you to go out praising our great God. I don't want you to go out burdened down and, and uh, feeling that you've been beat up on. No, I, I, don't, I want you to go home happy today. Now, my kids always said, Dad, all of your sermons have happy endings. Everybody is happy when you're done preaching. <laughs> I wasn't exactly sure what they meant by that. But I, so I didn't follow it up. But I think you can get the idea. God has things in us that are to, that are to lift us, to, to, to bring us up. I used to say, well, now, Brother West, don't you always try to make people happy? I'm afraid not. No, I don't. Sometimes I, I want to stir people up. Sometimes I want them to go out of here angry at the devil, angry at the flesh, angry that they gave the devil any victory at all in their life in the past week. So I want to, sometimes we, we just want to stir folks up. So uh, even the smallest victory that, that Satan has in my life is, not a, is, is something that I I'm, ought to get angry at. So I hope in the parking lot this morning you left a lot of things out there. I hope you left out there that the world is a depressing place. The world is a confused place. The world is, is a, a shocking place sometimes when we see the things that are going on, the things that are happening in our great country even. And so, yes, uh, it, there are things out there that can do that. But I hope you left them out there and just come in here with a heart open to something that God could say to us in his word to go out of here happy. Now, the church is a refuge. It's a safe haven. It's a place where you, you come when... Uh, it's, it's a hospital. Amen. It's a hospital for us. We come in here to get some spiritual meds, some things that will strengthen us, some things that will keep us focused in the right direction. And it gives us some, some spiritual, I don't know if it's a word or not, but we used to say spizzerunctum. Is that real? I think spiritual spizzerunctum is what we, were, what, we, what we were looking for. But anyhow, I say it's a hospital. It's a gymnasium where we come in here and we work on our spiritual weaknesses. 
We work on the things that God points out to us in his word and in our daily life. So it's a gymnasium. Now, sometimes working out in a gymnasium can give you sore muscles. Yeah, it can give you a little soreness sometimes, but that's okay. That's good, they tell us, because that means you're, you're exercising things that didn't get exercised before. And so that's what we want to see from the Word of God. It gives us some exercise in things that we're, we're not usually involved with. It's a family center. That is, it's a place, you know, some of you folks, I look, I see oh, Jeff down here and a couple other folks that we've known you people for a long time, for a number of years, and been a blessing. And, and this is a family. I mean, this, this is the things that, that the, the, the church does for us. There are times in a church that we ought to cry together. I'm sure there are, there's probably someone in this place today that needs someone else to come up and put an arm around their shoulders and say, hey, I'm going to pray for you this week. I know you're having a tough time. I'm going to pray for you. In, in, the, in a family, we laugh together, uh, and, and there are times when we cry together, but we, we love on each other. That's, that's what it is. It's, that's what the church is, is to do. That's what it's to be for us uh, in, in our walk with the Lord. As we grow older, and you can probably tell that I'm getting older, uh, minute by minute, it seems like now, now I used to count years, but now I don't count years as much as I, you know, just a month seems good to me if I look into the future. Uh, I used to say, you know, you say, I don't buy green bananas now, you know. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait for them. But uh, as we grow older, we spend more time on memories than we do on future plans. And to, to form good ones within the family of God is, is certainly something that, that carries us along. And as I started out to say this morning, the future grows brighter, but it also grows shorter. It also, we realize that uh, as we look at the world and we look at, at what God says, we know that we're winding down. We are getting close to where Jesus said, I am coming again. So I find myself now like the Apostle John as he ended up the book of Revelation saying, even so, come Lord Jesus. I pray that, I, I sincerely, pray. I think I'm, I'm, I mean it when I say, Lord, come today. Today would be a good day, Lord. Come now. And so... I, I, I find myself praying that more often. Here in Philippians chapter 3, and through, through chapter 4 verse 1, reminds us that our future is bigger, is better, it is brighter than anything we have ever known before. I remember reading about a man who went to a fortune teller one time, and the fortune teller looked at all the things, the cards and all this, and well, he said, you know, I see in your future that you are going to be uh, poor and unhappy until you are 39 years old. And the man said, well, what's going to happen at 39? And the fortune teller said, well, we get used to it. No, we don't get used to, we don't get used to being down. We get used to being what, what the, the, the future looking brighter to us. And no, I don't intend to remain in, in the, the bottom rung. Now, that's one thing that, that we are reminded of in these verses. Now, in, if you go back to verse 17, beginning in verse 17, there, there's a little bit of a, a, a difference. I say, this is the, the most uh, negative things that comes, comes out of the book of Philippians, where he says, brethren, join in following my example and note those who walk so walk, for you have us for a pattern, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and I tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. Now, you could make a case for saying, well, he's talking about unsaved people. 
Uh, or you can make a case for saying these people uh, have made a profession, but they haven't gone anywhere. I look at it and say, these people can't be saved. Why? My Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new person. We get a new mind. We get a new way of thinking. And these people, it says their mind is on earthly things. It has stayed there. One thing I need to do, though, is remind you this. And you know it. I'm not going to tell you anything new right now. But there are two sides. There are only two sides to this question of God and his relationship to man. Just two sides. A person is either a child of God or a child of the devil. A person is either saved or they are lost. There is no such thing as being almost saved. I, I can remember dealing with people at times, and I felt like I could just reach out and push them into the kingdom of God. But I couldn't do it. A person is either saved or lost by their own relationship with Jesus Christ. They are either on the broad way or they're on the narrow way. And reminding, these two ways do not run parallel. They run in opposite directions. Because one of them ends up in heaven and one of them ends up in hell. And so there are only two religions on planet earth. There is God's way and man's way. That's all. Oh, you can name a hundred ways that man has named it, but it's only one of two ways. Either man's way or God's way. Am I right so far? Good, I do better if you agree with me. That's just, yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, there's only, there's only these two. From these verses, I want to get you four thoughts that deal with uh, our future. And they deal with the bright side of life. And you have a little outline there that you can follow and you can fill in a couple of words if, uh, if, I, can, if I can get them out so that you can understand them. But the first thing is found in, in the word citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, if you have an old, anybody have an old King James Bible, the original old King James Bible? Anybody got one here? You got No? If you have the new King James, it's different. The old King James Bible says, for our conversation is in heaven. Now, uh, when that King James Bible was translated 400 years ago, the word that is translated there could have meant conversation uh, according to the, how the word was used in that time. To us, conversation is two people gabbing together, right? That's a conversation. But the, the word conversation back then meant something different when it was translated. So in the New King James or in the Living Bible, which are, whichever one, what does it say? Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, it's the same word that you will find translated freedom in other places. It is the word politeo. It is the word from which we get our word politics. Now, I like that. Because he's saying, our politics is in heaven. Our politics. How we view politics, how we view life, and our, our our approach to politics is to have a heavenly view, a heavenly perspective, uh, uh, to be viewed as, as it is viewed from heaven. Our politics is in heaven. Our citizenship, our politics. I know a lot of folks for whom an election that goes sour turns their life upside down. I, I, I have seen people that just become unglued over what happens in an election. Now, I, they don't always come out the way I want them, by the way. But I don't think I want to become unglued just because of that. Because I have a different outlook on it. Our politics is tied to our heavenly values. And our citizenship, our politics, is tied to what Heaven has directed me to you. Turn to your Bible, just over back a couple of pages to the book, of Philippi, or the book of Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, there is, uh, in verse 
chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, notice there, the word places is in italics, which means it was not there in the original. And it says, well, he has blessed us with spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. And several places in the book, he uses the term in the heavenlies. Now, if you are a, a, a grammar uh, nut, you know, your grammar bothers you if it's not done right, that, that you can't do that. It is an adjective without a noun. That's illegal. And so, but he says here, our, our politics is, in, is tied to heavenly things. Now, Paul didn't put a noun in there because he's dry, trying to draw attention to the fact that our, our politics, our life is tied to heavenly. He doesn't say what heavenly what, but it is tied to the things of heaven. Now, there is no such thing, I've always said, as a normal Christian life. I have read books about the normal Christian life. I don't think there is such an animal as the normal Christian life. Because we're constantly looking in a different direction. We are constantly looking for direction and guidance and strength in a different direction from the rest of the world around us. We march to a different drum. We answer a different phone. Because the things of our life are tied to heavenly values. The world accepts gay marriage today as though it were normal. We can't do that. Whoever it offends, we're sorry, but that is not scriptural, that is not from heavenly values. The world today looks at abortion as just a, an inconvenience for someone. We can't do that. We have to look at it as God's word says, as what comes to us from heaven. The world looks today as living together without the benefit of marriage as just something, oh, hey, so what, you know, big deal. Yeah, to us it is a big deal. Because it is making mockery of that which God has said is right yes. and ought to be done with directions from heaven. I know some of the things that go on make us shudder today in the world. The perversion that goes on. Some of the political statements that go on. Some of the things that are happening and it makes us shudder. Because we know that we are, uh, can, can move under, in a, put to a position where God can do nothing but judge us. And that, makes us that makes us shudder. When you and I take Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life, we establish a permanent outlook on life. And it is, it is something that we, we, we call it having a Christian or a biblical worldview. That means whatever comes into my life, whatever goes out of my life, is filtered through, thus saith the Lord. Amen. What God says, it is tied to my heavenly relationship. I am not a citizen of earth who is trying to make my way to heaven. No, I'm not. I am a citizen of heaven who has a temporary address here on earth. That's why a number of times we are referred to in scripture as strangers. That is, a stranger is someone who doesn't fit. A stranger is someone who is on the outside. A stranger is someone who may be looking for something, but he is not a part of the, of the overall situation. He's a stranger to it. We're also referred to as pilgrims. Now, I say a pilgrim doesn't fit, or I mean a stranger doesn't fit, but a pilgrim is on his way somewhere. And that's us. We're on our way somewhere. That's why we're given those titles, those descriptions, our job description. 
is strangers and pilgrims. We're also referred to as aliens. Now, I've got to be very careful here, talking about aliens and so on. But an alien is some, simply someone who is a non-resident. Now, I have an address here, but my, my citizenship is in heaven, so I am a non-resident in that sense. I am, an, I am an alien. So that's why God refers to us this way, because our citizenship is different. We have a different outlook. Now, while we are here, we are reminded that we are to be good citizens. We are to be good residents. We are to be good aliens. We are to be subject to the laws of the land in which we live. And unless those laws conflict with the word of God, I am to do my best to obey the laws, except the speed limit. That's something you can put on the outside. <laughs> but uh, as, a, as, a, as an, uh, a resident here, uh, an alien, a resident, but I'm, a re I'm residing here, uh, I, unless those laws conflict with the, the word of God, I am going to do my best to obey them. Now, people live under all types of government. Over the centuries, there have been all types of government. God only gave one book. And in that book, he does not make exceptions for anyone. He does not say you can be a, a believer and walk with God unless you happen to live under a certain kind of government. No, he doesn't say that. Just one book. And it, it certainly reminds us that we can be a Christian anywhere. Now he says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Problem begins when Caesar wants what belongs to God. And we, we, we are to render to him, we're to vote. I think Christians ought to vote. I think, they ought to, I think they ought to let their voice be heard in the, in the marketplace. I think they ought to render to Caesar those things that are Caesar's. Even though we are, uh, our citizenship at this point is in a, a different place, but you can be a Christian anywhere and render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. I also have discovered that we are not we are not eligible for its honors, for the honors of this world. In fact, we're not even to seek the honors of this world. Paul says in back in, in uh, verse, oh, same, ch same chapter 3 of Philippians, in, in verse 7, he says, What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yea, indeed, I count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Not only am I not eligible for its honors, my highest calling is to be a servant. Who wants to volunteer to be a servant somewhere? No, nobody does that. Well, when it, except when it comes to the things of the Lord, yes. That's my highest calling, is to be a servant of God. And I know others will look down on saying, a servant? Yes, a servant. And we are, that's, a, that's the, the, the greatest calling I can have is to serve God. It did not take me long in this world to discover that its treasures aren't mine either. The things uh, that I, I used to treasure are, are entirely different. Paul said, he said that I count them but trash. He said I count them as of no value. Something that is not to be sought after. Because one of these days, what am I going to do with it? I'm going to leave it. You, you heard about the rich man who passed away and somebody said, well, how much did he leave? What did they say? He left it all. Yes. And that's you, you and I. You read the book of Ecclesiastes and you'll find that, that referred to over and over again. You're going to work your life to accumulate a bunch and then they're going to leave it all to somebody else. No. Uh, I've discovered that its treasures are not mine. They don't, they don't. They're not permanent. I saw a little, we saw a part of a, a, a little thing on last night on, a, on what was called the Mully family. Did anybody see that program, Mully family? 
This is a man, an African man, who was who grew up uh, as an orphan, and he was uh, all of his his. Uh, uh, life, he worked hard, and he rose to a position. He was a multimillionaire in Africa. And one day, in his relationship with God, God said to him, leave it all. He went home to his wife and five kids. I think it was five at least. And he said, we are going to stop working for money. We are going to serve God. He took everything that he had, he took all of the things that he had accumulated and they start, they have an orphanage with 15,000 kids going on in Kenya. And it told his story. And this man seems to be a genuine uh, lover of Christ. And that's what he said. I don't, this means, this, all of this means nothing to me unless I can serve God. And he helped it with these orphan kids. So, uh, yes, I share. I, in this world, I share the inconveniences of the flesh also. The things that bother others bother me. Now, maybe not as much at some point, but uh, yeah, I, I share the inconveniences of the flesh. I take part in its sorrows. I take part in its trials. I take part in the... Th if I were living in a country where there are bombs falling, they would fall on me just like anybody else. This past year, we, we had a wedding for a, a, a relative up in, up in Oregon. And at this wedding, the, the mother of the, of the bride, uh, we were introduced to her, and so we talked for a while. And she had lived in Paradise, California. Do you know what happened in Paradise, California? And she pulled out her phone, and she said, here's our house. A big pile of ashes. Nothing. They have nothing left. Now you say, wow, that's you know, this woman was a missionary. She had spent most of her life on the mission field with her husband and family. And yet she shared in the inconveniences that were going on at that time. And you and I do too. We share the inconveniences of the flesh. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 13. He says this that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Amen. That he may establish us. And so we, we share in a lot of these things that are going on. And they hurt us just as much as anybody else. But it's, but I'm, I, I, I remain a stranger. I remain a pilgrim. Because... I know that somewhere in heaven is a registry, a book, that has my name written in it. There is, my name is recorded there. On March 24th, 1949, as a 15-year-old high school dropout on a dead-end street, Someone took the time, a used car salesman, by the way, took the time to get a couple of us kids together and explain to them how to be saved. I had utterly no spiritual background. You could count on one hand the times I had ever been to church up until I was 15 years old. And this man explained to us what it meant to put your faith and trust in Christ. And at 15 years of age, I became a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, I know if you're doing the math, that's 85 years ago. Yes. I became a believer in Christ. Or not 85 years ago, 70 years. It's a, it's a long time, anyhow. But <laughs> but I've never been the same. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. And so... We have a, there a registry with our name on it. One of these days, the, us, the angels are going to usher us up there to the gates. If there is a gate like that, I'm not sure. The angels are going to usher us up to the gate. And then I'm going to give them my name, and they're going to say, look down in the book, you know, there it is, back there on page 1,380. There, well, your name is there, yes. 
On March 24th, 1949, you did. You became a child of God. Now, you see, my future is bound up in that homeland. Everything about me, all that you can look at it in my life is bound up in that citizenship in heaven. Now, all of us can look at life's experiences and say, man, that was close, yeah? How close I came to a, a, a wreck. How close I came to slipping over the edge. And it is because in heaven, they are looking out for us. They are caring for us. There are angels that have charge over things in our life. You have saints for friends. Isn't that something? If they don't make you happy, you better check your pulse. You have saints for friends. And to someone, you are saint so-and-so. And do you and I have that, that relationship because our citizenship is in heaven. And in the light of, of, of eternity, no possession, no ability, no physical accomplishment, no pet peeve is worth anything if I can't translate it into something in regards to heaven. If I can't use it, for him. And the sum total of our life, we say, is being directed from above. Amen. That ought to, that ought to make you go out of here happy. If nothing else does, it's, it's, we're noted our life is, is under the direction of, of, of eternity. Now, the second thing that I want to remind you of, the first one was citizenship. Did you get that down? Okay, citizenship. The second thing that I want to remind you of, and I'll have to move a little quickly maybe, but anyhow, uh, notice what it says here, that we eagerly wait for the coming of the Savior. We eagerly wait for the coming of the Savior. Now, Paul is good at using superlatives. Now, he could have said, from which we also wait for the Savior. But he didn't say that. He said we eagerly wait for the Savior. I'm not sure how you can eagerly wait. I mean, to wait means, you know, I'm waiting. Eagerly means I'm, I'm, I'm up and I'm going. So I'm not sure how I can eagerly wait. But he uses a superlative here to remind us that it's an active kind of energy. It's an active kind of waiting. And, and uh, Paul, John says, it does not appear what we shall be, what we know when he appears will be like him. So that's what I'm waiting for. I view that. I, I look at that. And his coming tells me that there's something big about to happen. I got a magazine not too long ago, and, and the lead article in it is, Whatever Happened to the Second Coming? And it, I, I didn't know exactly what it was, but what it was, they were saying, you know, you don't hear much about the Second Coming. You don't hear a whole lot about the rapture of the church anymore. Uh, a lot of these things have, have fallen by the wayside to, to different kinds of, of preaching. But whatever, and, and I thought, we well, you know, that's not enough. He ought to have said, whatever happened to sin? Nobody talks about sin in, in churches these days. In fact, one of the biggest churches in America, the man says, I never mention sin. I never talk about sin. That's negative. Absolutely it is. How do you think God views it? But he said, I never, I never mentioned sin. So I would say, well, whatever happened to sin? Or whatever happened to the blood? People don't preach about the blood anymore. I remember a song that we sing, and you probably sing it here. And in this song, it mentions the blood of Christ that satisfied the wrath of God. And a, 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 a company that wanted to put songs together asked the author, could they use this, this song? And he said, yes. But he said, but he said, we need to change this one line about the blood of Christ and, and satisfying the wrath of God. He said, you won't change it. His song didn't get put in the book. 
And you will find many of the modern songbooks don't have songs that talk about the blood. Or we could talk about uh, whatever happened to heaven. People don't hear a lot about heaven. Most of the preaching that goes on today is centered around how to make your life successful now. How to feel good now. How to be successful. How to become well adjusted. How to get rich. Most of the preaching or much of the preaching is centered around those themes. A year or so ago, one of the best books on the bestseller list was Your Best Life Now. And I, you, you know the guy with the big smile and the curly hair who, who writes, writes these books about your best life now. And somebody was reviewing it and he said, you know, when I'm all done with this, I have to think if this is going to be my best life now, I must be headed for hell. <laughs> because if, this, if I'm trying to make this my best life, well, uh, what's, what's, what's ahead? Our direct promise is, if I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself. I will come back. Now, either he meant it or he didn't. And there is nothing in life or in this book that causes me to think he was telling us a falsehood. No. He meant it. And he is coming back. And that's why I say, they they, they had this article, whatever happened to the second coming? People don't talk about it. And their, their emphasis was, we are entering the time, the phase that Peter says, people will say, where is the promise of his coming? For since time began, things have gone on the same. And we're entering that phase in much of a, the church life today. People saying the same things. Now, I realize when it comes to the, to the rapture and the second coming, there's a lot of disagreement. I mean, you'll find people of all kinds of... A, a year or so ago, it was the blood moons. Do you remember the blood moons? Everybody was excited about the blood moons. When the blood moon happened, something big was going to take place. And it came and went and nothing happened. And we've had those kind of situations down through the years. Some time ago, I, I was watching a program, and there were five prophecy experts. I'm not sure what a prophecy expert is, but there were five prophecy experts. And out of those five, if I listened to them about 15 minutes, I found more disagreement than you could find under any other circumstance, or any other uh, subject in the Bible. They all disagreed on everything. But they were experts. In fact, you could hear one of them, a couple of them say, well, you know, in studying this, the Holy Spirit told me this. And the next one gets up and says, well, you know, in studying this, the Holy Spirit told me this. They're exact opposites. No, they're not experts. They're they're dreamers. But uh, anyhow, you'll find a lot of disagreement on this. But you will find several times. Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, says also, those of us who eagerly wait for the coming of the Savior. Eagerly wait. That means there's an action going on. There's, there's something stirring us and moving us. We eagerly wait. Well, the doc in his prayer was mentioning our country, our nation. And the, the statistics show that there is more anti-Jewish activity in our nation than any other country in the world right now. Shame on us. We better start looking upward. Because that puts us under the direct judgment and hand of God. So, yes, there are things that are happening, but we eagerly wait for our Savior. The third thing is this, in verse 21, where he says that when the Savior comes, he will transform or change our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. A great change is coming, that he will change our lowly body to be like his. 
There was a film out this past year, and a, it's because it's, it's a song that I've heard a number of years over the years called I Can Only Imagine. You, you, you've heard that song, I Can Only Imagine. I wish I could. I, 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 the try as I may, my mind, the circuits burn out when I try to imagine what eternity is going to be. And you can put every superlative in there that you want to, but it does not begin to cover what it really is going to be. I cannot imagine what it is to stand in his presence. Turn with me for, for just a moment to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I read these verses for a reason. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 16, he says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. Those are some verses that you ought to read every year on your birthday. Excuse me, I just got to wet my whistle a minute. I know everybody begins to say right now, boy, I'm thirsty. And they say, read those every year on your birthday. The reason being, those are God's uh, explanation. That is God's perspective on aging, on getting old. That's his perspective on getting old. I have finally realized that I am the older generation. It has taken me a while, but I have finally realized I am the older generation. A few years ago, on my 80th birthday, all my kids got together and we had a big birthday bash, and uh, nobody bought me a skateboard. You know that? <laughs> nobody bought me a basketball. And I'm, I'm not sure I was disappointed, but to make up for it, we played croquet. You know? <laughs> I thought a good game of tackle football would be good, but no, we played croquet. But, you see, this is God's, how God prepares us for eternity by unpreparing us for life on earth. After a while, we realize we, we do not fit so well. And He is unpreparing us for life because He's going to change things. There's going to be a great change change taking place and we're winding it down to where we're going to welcome that change without any hesitation to know that we will be like him it's also you'll discover it's a great excuse for being forgetful it's a great excuse for doing dumb things you know hey i'm old i have i have come across Probably 15 people here that gave me their names this morning. I hope there's not going to be a test at the end. <laughs> because if I, the next time I see you, you'll have a different name, I'm pretty sure. At least the one I remember doesn't fit. But, uh, yeah, we will, be, we will have this change. We will become like him. I had a sister who was... 80-some years old, passed away a couple of years ago and back in Ohio, and we went to visit her. And in the hospital, we, we talked with her, and while we were there, the, the couple of nurses came in and said, now, uh, we have to do some procedures here. Could you step out for a minute? And, and they said, I want, we want you to go down the hall. There's a, there's a waiting room down there where there is someone who wants to talk to you. So we went down the hall, and sure enough, there was a man in there, very nicely dressed, he was the hospital psychiatrist. And he said, we want to explain to you uh, about death and about uh, what's happening with your sister and so on. I said, hold it just a minute, Doc. See, years ago, we settled this issue. There is nothing that you could tell us that will explain to us what is going on here. This is someone who is getting ready to step into eternity, and she knows where she's going. 
So I gave him a tract and headed out the door. No, I don't need any explanation for it. I know what's going to happen. I know about this change. Now, we all age, but I'm sure you don't do it with the, with the same frantic, with all these brown spots. Why I got all these brown spots? Well, what's, well, look at all these spots. Why did I get all those? Hey, I earned them. By living this long, I earned them. But God's going to take them all away. He's going to change everything. He will change our lowly body. Amen. Just wait. Just wait. It's coming. Now, don't leave. I got one more. He says here that he will change our lowly body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. There's going to be a grand climax to all of this. He is going to subdue, he's going to set in order all the things of life. The grand climax of it all. His glorious conclusion is he will subdue all things, put all things in their proper order. He will set it in its proper, it won't be the United Nations, by the way, he won't have, they, I don't think they'll have anything to do with it. I don't even think it'll be the Republicans or the Democrats, whichever, no. He will set all things into their proper order. Think about it for a minute. Mankind has been trying for umpty thousand years to establish utopia. I mean, you would think that over these thousands of years we would have perfected it and got it so we would be utopia. It would, everything would, would be working smoothly. Everything would be going well. Now, I, I certainly agree this. The USA is the, is the best that can be done. I have no doubt about that. I've lived in other countries. I know that it is the best that can possibly be. But you will also notice as you look at the best that can possibly be, when you take God out of the process, when you take God out of the equation, what happens? Right back down. Right back down to its lowest common denominator. So yeah, we've been trying for thousands of years. And I think God has been silent. God has let it go to show us. You can't do it on your own. You can never do it on your own. Humanity is not capable of it. So he is coming to put all things in their proper order. So, you got the picture. It's a changed world, will be a changed world for a changed people. People who are prepared and ready for this new world. Now let me wrap up here. Are you ready for it? We well, say, I'm in church. It doesn't mean a thing. Are you ready for that change? Yes, I'm ready. Good, I, I, I love to hear positive notes. Yes, yes, I'm ready. But can you look back in time? Can you look back in your life? Just right now, run the scroll and look back in life. Can you find that time, that moment, when you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior. It may have been in Sunday school, it may have been at home, it may have been in a church service, it may have been out on the street corner somewhere. But can you find that moment when you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you said, yes, I want Jesus Christ to be my Savior? If I were to come back there to where you'll be standing in a moment and look you straight in the eye, and I were to say, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? What would you say to me? What would you say? Yes, or maybe shuffle your feet a little bit and say, well, I, I, you know, I think I, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure. No! That you may know that you have eternal life.
That's the whole purpose of it, that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, he says here in, in chapter 4, verse 1, therefore. Now, you know what you do when you see a therefore? You stop and see what it's there for, right? right. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, stand fast in the Lord. Amen. Hey, go out happy. Stand fast in the Lord if you know, if you can answer that question, yes, I know where I'm going to spend eternity. But if I were to walk back there and you would say, well, Brother Wes, I, I, I'm not sure, but I think I, I wrote my name on that piece of paper that they gave me one time, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure that I shook their hand, the, 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 somebody's hand at some time. No. I want to know that you can find a moment in your life that you, with understanding and with knowledge, you said, I am asking Jesus Christ to come into my heart and be my Savior. If not, when this hour is over, I would like to talk to you. Or Pastor Doc would like to talk to you. Or one of the other elders would like to talk with you. Don't go out of here hoping. Don't go out of here wondering. Stand fast. In the Lord. Father, we're so grateful that your word is clear, it is true, it is steadfast, it doesn't change, and it's not the culture, it's not calamities, it's not chaos that causes us to follow you, but because we're citizens of heaven and we have something worthwhile. So, Father, as we close this hour, I pray that your Holy Spirit will move in someone's heart if they're not sure. Also, our Father, to challenge us to go out into that world because there's somebody out there who needs us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.